so today I'm going to explain how this, a gyroscope, works. Alright, so before I explain how it works, I should probably explain, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, what a gyroscope is. And, well, this is a gyroscope. It consists of a wheel in the center, which spins, um, and then around it, it has a ring, which connects to the two ends of the wheel to allow the wheel something to spin on, so it has like a pivot point, essentially. Uh, and then there's a ring around the circumference of the wheel to protect the wheel in case it bumps into something, so the wheel won't stop spinning. Uh, and now what's cool about a gyroscope is if you get it spinning, I use a string, uh, it will hold its position, or its relative position in space. Then you may think, alright, well, that's just kind of like a top, which is true, I mean a top and a gyroscope do operate on the same principle, but what's cool about a gyroscope is it can do this. Yeah, I don't know of any top that can do that, and that's a rather interesting feat, which is why I thought I should explain how it can do that. Essentially, gravity-defying effect. Now, the part of the gyroscope that causes the cool effects is really just the wheel. Uh, the outer rings just provide protection and a connection point for the wheel, but they don't really do anything to cause the cool effect. The only thing that causes the cool effect is the spinning of the wheel itself. That's what causes the effect. And when the wheel is spinning, it creates something known as precession. Um, and precession resists any force uh, that tries to change its relative position in space. So, i.e., when I picked it up the string and it was in this general position, uh, it wanted to stay in this general position and would resist any force trying to move it out of this position. I.e., it would resist the force of gravity trying to get it to go like that, to, like, hang down by the string. Uh, it wanted to stay up like this and it would resist the force of gravity to move it downwards. Um... And this is actually the same principle of, as I mentioned earlier, tops, but also bicycles. As when you get a spinning wheel, they want to hold their relative position in space. Uh, and this force, as I already mentioned, is known as precession. But of course, you might be wondering, well, what is precession? Well, to explain that, I need to explain a couple other things first. Alright, so the first thing I'm going to explain is angular momentum. Now, before I get into that, I'm going to first give the equation for standard momentum, which is P for momentum. And that equals mass times velocity. So momentum is mass times velocity. Angular momentum, then, is L for angular momentum, which is mass times velocity, but then it's times the radius. So, well, ma so mass and velocity still matter, but it also matters as to how, how far out from the axis of rotation it is. So I, you say we have our circle here. It's not a very big circle, but well. And we have our mass here, you know, m, and our velocity, v, well, it also matters as to how far away from the center of the circle it is, so how far out it is to rotate. So that matters for angular momentum as well. And one other thing, momentum is conserved. So if we have a momentum L here, the momentum L will be the same throughout the circle. Momentum is conserved. Now, friction does take away some of the momentum, uh, but I'll cover that later in the video. So, until I get to that, just keep in mind that momentum is conserved, and we can ignore friction for the time being. Now, the next thing I need to explain is the Coriolis effect. So, say we're standing on a circle, like uh, a merry-go-round, for example, uh, and we're standing on it, and the circle is spinning. Well, from our perspective, the circle isn't spinning. Essentially, everything around us is spinning. It's kind of all based on perspective. But essentially, we're standing on a spinning circle, but it doesn't look like it's spinning to us. Now, we'll say that the circle is rotating like this. So it's rotating counterclockwise. And then we have a ball centered right here, and we want it to go down like this. Down like that. Well, what we do is if we roll it down like that, with that intended path, it'll go off like that. It'll go over off to the left. Now, that's kind of a weird effect, and we may be wondering why that happens. Well, say we're over off on this circle here, and it's rotating. Well, if we're not on the perspective of, of the circle, we're like standing right here above the circle, like looking at the screen, and we roll the ball on the circle that's still spinning this way, 
the ball, when we push it down like this, it looks like it's going like that. Now, the reason when we're standing on the circle, it looks like it's covering off to the right, is say we were standing here at this point. Well, we move over to here when it gets down here. So really, from an outside perspective, the ball's moving straight down. It's just that we're moving over off to here, so it looks like the ball is moving away from us. Now we can get into the gyroscope itself. And for the gyroscope, I have two pictures of it. Uh, the first picture here is essentially as though it were like this. We have a gyroscope, and I've removed the rings, because we don't really need it. The wheels are all that matters. Um, so it's essentially just like the wheel as though it were like this. Uh, with then the string going up like that. And then this other picture here is as though we were to look on top of it, as though we were to be holding the string and then looking down on it. Because this little red dot here is where the string is, and then this being the wheel and that being the axle. So, the blue is the gyroscope, and the red is the string. The green, then, is the, essentially, the way it'll rotate. Now, since it's a tra it'll essentially rotate about this axis, due to the force of gravity. Now, in actuality, it'll rotate about this axis. You know, that's where it'll actually happen. But, the physics for are the same for both of these situations. They're transferable. And it's going to be much easier to explain if I go from this axis than the actual one. So, since it's transferable, we're just going to go with that one. Just trust me on it. Now, the gyroscope works very heavily off of the Coriolis effect. And essentially, what's going to happen is the wheel here is the front part. We're looking at essentially the front part. The front part is moving up. So, the wheel is kind of going like up like that. So, if we were to look at the side, with the string being in the back, it'll be going like this, if you can imagine that. But essentially, the front part of the wheel that we're looking at is going to be going up. So, and, due to the force of gravity acting essentially on this end, since this end is supported by the string, the force of gravity is going to be pushing down here, so the force of gravity is going to cause it to rotate like that. It's going to cause it to rotate, it wants the gyroscope to rotate like that. So that's due to the force of gravity. Now, due to the Coriolis effect, essentially what's going to happen is, say we've got like a point here, it's going to be moving up, and it's going to look like it's just moving up from outside its perspective. But, if we were to, due to the Coriolis effect, if we were to look at it actually in the system itself, it'll actually be going, you know, like that. It'll be going off that way. Um, and anyway, this is from the front end of it. So, essentially, this force will be going from that way. Looking from the top view, the force will be going from that way on that side. While on the other side, uh, since it's essentially kind of, you know, backwards, the force will be going that way. So, what will end up happening is this whole thing will end up rotating like that. So, it'll all end up rotating, essentially, in that way, due to the Coriolis effect and the force of gravity. Now, you may be wondering, well, how is it able to change directions like that? Well, keep in mind our angular momentum equation, which is L equals V times R times M. Now, M is, at any point, is essentially the same throughout, so we can get rid of that. And L is constant, which means it's the same throughout. So, since this is essentially the circle we're looking at, uh, and it's rotating like this, our angular momentum is like this, so at any point on the circle, it needs to be the same. At any point in this circle, it needs to be the same. Well, since we're looking from here at this radius, our velocity is going to be very low, because our r is going to be big, so our v is going to be at a minimum when it's way out here, while when it's centered right here, our v is going to be very high, because our radius is essentially going to be very low. Remember how angular momentum works, is that we look from the axis of rotation, and the distance from that uh, gives... The distance from that gives us a radius, and since the angular momentum needs to be the same, uh, so way up here, way at the edge up here, you know, right here, our radius is at a maximum, which means our velocity is at a minimum, and it's essentially zero, so that allows it to essentially change directions there, so the physics all works out. Now we have a couple new diagrams. The gyroscope is still in blue, and the string is still red or in red, um, and then the 
way it's, you know, turning is still in green. Um, but this time, this is a gyroscope, as though we were holding from the string and looking from above. And then this is the gyroscope, uh, as though this was a string and we were, you know, holding it like this. So essentially, I just kind of switched the diagrams. Um, and as I established in my, you know, previous clip, the gyroscope, due to, you know, the force of gravity and the Coriolis effect, is now spinning like this. Um, now, since it's spinning like this, this creates a new set of Coriolis effect. Um, and as we already established, the wheel is kind of rotate was rotating, when we were looking at it from this way, the wheel was rotating up. Now the wheel is rotating to the right when we're looking at it from above. You know, keep wheel rotation in there. Um, and going back to the Coriolis effect, if a point moves like this, from an outside perspective, again, it looks like it's going like that, but due to the Coriolis effect, it is actually going like that. So it's going like that. Which again, causes it to go like that on the top, because we're looking at it from the top, and from the bottom it's in reverse, so it causes it to go like that. This then causes it a force to go like that, which, as you may notice, negates the force of gravity. So, and this is what precession is. Precession is when you apply a force on one end, um, but it goes then in a direction 90 degrees to the way you apply the force. That's what precession is. And through double precession, the gyroscope is able to negate the force of gravity. Now, of course, with my explanation, you may have a couple questions about it. Uh, first off, well, if the force of gravity causes it to rotate like this, uh, and due to precession, that then causes it to rotate clockwise, and due to precession again, that causes it to rotate upwards like that, wouldn't precession, again, from the upwards rotation, cause it to rotate counterclockwise, which in turn causes it to rotate downwards, and that same pattern would keep continuing? Well, no, this would not actually happen, because as it rotates, because it never really goes upwards, the upward force just negates the force of gravity. Because the force of gravity causes it to rotate like this, um, and when it starts rotating like this, it creates an upward force, which slowly pushes up against the force of gravity until it neutralizes it. If it were to go become more than the force of gravity and start causing it to push up, then since this is already rotating clockwise like this, it would then stop rotating clockwise as much. And it, I mean, it wouldn't start rot it wouldn't start rotating counterclockwise since it's already rotating counter or clockwise so much. It would just not rotate clockwise as much. So it's like going really fast, like going really fast, but then it would kind of just slow down a little. So, since it would slow down a little, um, the upward force then would become less, which means that the force of gravity would overtake it a little and cause it to then kind of, which would then cause it to rotate clockwise more. So, the upward force can never really overpower the downward force, only just negate it. Now, another question you probably have is my whole explanation relies on the fact that it would turn to create the Coriolis effect, but you argue that. Well, it never really turns. It always pretty much stays in its position. Well, that's not entirely true. I mean, say we have it spinning, um, and then I were to hold it like this. Now, you'll notice there's another sound to it, and it does in fact start rotating clockwise like that. So, since it's rotating clockwise, you can tell that an upwards force is created, but you don't ever notice it go downwards. Well, the vibrate, or the extra sound you heard in there, is actually it going downwards, but then also back upwards very quickly, uh, and that causes the wheel, since it's not, you know, firmly in place, to vibrate really rapidly, um, which creates that sound. Now, the way that works is the force of gravity, when it initially starts, there is no, you know, upwards force because it hasn't started moving down at all. So the force of gravity causes it to move downwards. Now this then creates a Coriolis effect, which causes it to rotate, which then causes it to create an upward force, which then negates the force of gravity. So it does that very rapidly. Now, as it is spinning, it's that slowly slows. Now due to friction, as it is spinning, it slowly slows down, which causes 
the upward force to decrease, which means the force of gravity pushes down slightly, but then of course it speeds up due to the Coriolis effect that I explained earlier, which causes the upwards force to then, again, negate the force of gravity. And this whole being pushed down, which speeds up the spinning, which then pushes it back up, all happens extremely fast, like within a fraction of a second, so you can't tell that it's moving down, since it moves down so little. But it does in fact move down, and you can tell by the vibrations. So it does actually move down, allowing for the Coriolis effect. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is friction. And while it did account for some of it, and you know, causing the vibrations, there is also another form of friction um, in the wheel, which causes it to slowly slow down. Because you'll notice that as it spins more and more, it takes a little while, because it's, you know, well lubricated, so it as well. But you'll notice that it slowly fell an angle and eventually got to such an angle that it would fall off the string. Now, this is because the friction, there is some friction between the wheel which causes it to slowly spin down, or slowly slow down. And as it slows down, the Coriolis effect doesn't happen as quickly, which means that the force isn't as powerful. So as the force of gravity pushes, so as this friction slows down slightly, the force of gravity becomes a little more powerful, so it can push down a little more, which then causes it to speed up a little more, which again causes the, um, you know, the upwards force to increase. And But as this slowly continues to slow down, the force of gravity is slowly able to overcome it and eventually get it to hang down like that. So that is how friction plays a role in the gyroscope. Now, the last thing you're probably wondering is, well, if it can negate the force of gravity, why can I move it? Well, I mean, it is noticeably more difficult, and it doesn't go exactly where I want it when I move it up. It angles to the side. Like, when I push it up, it, like, goes down at that angle. Like, I'm pushing it down, it goes to that angle. Well, that's because... But the reason I'm able to move it at all is because, you know, I'm stronger than the force of gravity. I mean, that's evidenced by the mere fact that I can lift it up. The spinning wheel can only negate a certain amount of force, you know, as evidenced by, as the friction slowly causes it to slow down, the wheel slowly goes like that, because the force of gravity takes it. So, the velocity of the wheel, um, so how much force it can overcome depends on the velocity of the wheel, and quite frankly, I can apply more force to it than the gyroscope can negate, so that's why I'm able to move it, but it can still negate gravity. Yeah, I Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something, and see ya.